we can start. Okay. Sure, we can. <coughs> wait, wait. YouTube is still showing that uh, one minute is left. It's two minutes more. Twenty-eight now. It means we are live. Check now. Oh my God! It's just it's still showing one minute twenty-six seconds left. <laughs> uh, refresh it. Data. Refresh it because uh, I uh, Iris PG is showing that they have started. There might be time lag. Ask uh, them to reload the page. Ma'am, do you want to switch on your camera or is this fine? My camera. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I I can't see you. Switch on the camera. You know how to switch on. What do I do now? Oh, start video. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now yeah. we can see you also. Okay. Okay. Hey, uh, someone refresh the page in YouTube. Yeah, I'm Re- just give me one minute. It says fifteen. Oh, it started now. It's staying forty four seconds. It's still left. Guys, please start. Okay, we are live. So I'll start now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start. Okay, fine. So on behalf of IMA, we welcome all. For the What to Do workshop by IMMS in Tamil Nadu, Med Infinite 2020 is an online medical conference conducted by the IMMS in and JD in Tamil Nadu for the medical students and doctors from July 16 till September 15. Mastering the cognitive knowledge within a field such as emergency medicine is a formidable task. It is even more difficult to draw on that knowledge, procure and filter through the clinical and laboratory data, develop a differential diagnosis. and finally to form a rational treatment plan ima msn welcomes all medicos with the courage to run towards the problem where death remains challenged and defeated in front of the emergency situations where knowledge, medical knowledge is approached in matter of seconds we welcome all the bold knights to adorn their shining ppes and clad their stethoscopes for a fun filled disastrous scenarios in medicine and restore hope through this workshop learn to identify the emergency cases where symptoms may be hidden but won't miss the daring vision of a doctor let's learn and get inspired for a wonderful presentation by one of our best speakers dr g shri devi md in accident and emergency medicine shri ramachandra medical college and research institute ma'am please take over yeah hello good afternoon everyone so uh... we are going to talk on common emergencies i'm not going to talk uh, like what is mi what is the history what is our, uh, what is the uh, complications all that i'm just going to practically deal with how do you deal with the cases if a patient comes with mi or chest pain how do you deal with how do you come to the diagnosis that's what i'm going to talk on this is uh, more of practical knowledge rather than a theoretical knowledge okay thank you we'll start now okay so uh, old man come to uh, coming to the emergency department with history of severe chest pain and a sweating so what do you think of first any any patient coming to the emergency the first thing you are supposed to do is triage the patient what do you mean by triage triage is nothing but sorting of patients when a patient is uh, having chest pain okay you are going to ask a small history short history okay what is the chest pain where is the chest pain and how severe is the chest pain and then of course you are going to check the vitals like the blood pressure heart rate and saturation which is important very much important nowadays and then of course the capillary blood glucose for all the patients coming to the emergency that's what we do in our srmc and okay then what is it what is the next thing you receive the patient in the medical bay okay then what else what else you will think of say all the chest pains are not mis and all the mis are not having uh, will not have a chest pain the pa- the patient can come with abdominal pain shoulder pain or any pain but still they can have an mi you should not uh, miss out an mi okay so what are the differential diagnosis you can think of when a patient comes with uh, chest pain so the first important is you have to rule out mi don't think okay patient is having a um, gastric pain which, okay it should be a just a gastritis and give some uh, pan or gigelucil uh, and then just send them send them away okay so like you should never miss i'll tell you a scenario what happened uh, uh, one 30 year old boy I mean guy has gone to a hospital okay with a gastric pain okay so the hospital uh, there was no doctor there and because it's a very small hospital the nurse was there okay he uh, looks like a gastritis you just have uh, uh, gelucil syrup it will you'll be fine 
Okay, the same patient was brought to the emergency department of SRMC, but brought dead. Okay, so there is a, there was a slip when where uh, the patient has gone to a small hospital and they have given a uh, just a jellucil or pan or something and they have sent it to. But if they would have taken an ECG, they would have not missed the MI. Even if they can't do anything, they could have sent the patient to a tertiary care hospital rather than just giving pan or uh, something like that. Okay, so the most commonest uh, cases we see with the chest pain is MI, and the next is the pneumothorax. Okay, of course, gastritis will come. Uh, if you can, you cannot miss one patient of MI, MI, but you can miss gastritis. That's okay, but you should not miss MI or a pneumothorax, which is will end up with a uh, death actually. Okay. Okay, what is the immediate action? The options I've given is jelucil syrup, three spoons, uh, injection pantoprazole, 40 mg IV stat, rest and sorbitrate under the tongue, maybe the muscle spasm. So what they do, okay, the chest pain is there, I'll put some diclofenac ointment, you'll be okay. Okay, that's what some people do. So all that is not necessary. What you are, What is your action is, okay? Sorry. So action is rest and sorbitrate under the tongue. So assure the patient, okay, you have an MI, you are, anything can happen, don't, don't tell the patient like that, okay? So tell them nothing is there, you are okay, you, you reassure the patient first, which is very, very important. And then we'll give, give medicines, it'll be okay, you'll, you'll be fine soon. So the talking is very, 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 very important on a, uh, a ER setup. So what is an MI? It's nothing but uh, there will be decrease in oxygen. The oxygen and nutrition, nutrients in the blood is not sufficient. It's not sufficient for the demands of the heart. So that's why the muscle of the heart aches. So that's why the patient passes with chest pain. So what is what do you mean by point of care testing? Point of care testing is nothing but the test which you do on the bedside is called as point of care testing. So like ECG, cardiac, whatever test, cardiac enzymes, chest X-ray, what are the tests we do? And then uh, what else uh, we do? Echo we do, and then um, ultrasound we do in a point of care testing. These are all uh, the point of care testing. So for this patient, what is important now? ECG is important. Okay, that is that will take not more than five to five to ten minutes. Okay, so you are taking ECG, and then cardiac enzymes. Mainly, what are the cardiac enzymes? Troponin I, BNP. These are the important cardiac enzymes, which will come, which will take around uh, twenty minutes to half an hour for the results to come. Chest X-ray, maybe half an hour. Echo also will be within, within half an hour. So when you take an ECG, so what do you see? So this is a normal ECG I'm showing this. So this is a normal P. So there are about uh, 12 leads here, okay? Lead one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1 to V6. So these six are limb leads, and these six are precordial leads. That is, we, you are keeping the leads over the Precordial, so that's called as this is why it's called as uh, precordial leads. Okay, these are called the limb leads. So you see every lead, you see a P, QRS, and a T wave. Okay, this is a P, this is a QRS, and a T wave, right? Okay. So this is normal ECG. When you call the patient is having a uh, ST elevation MI. See, this is the J point. This is the J point. So if you can see here, this is the P, this is the Q. This is the R and this is S and this is the T wave. So I don't want to go in, uh, go in what is P wave, what is QR and what is T wave. I think most of them uh, will know, okay? So what is important here is this is the J point, okay? Can you see? This point is a J point. If this, this is the isoelectric line. If this J point is elevated more than one millimeter, okay? So you see, you see five small squares are there here. So this is one millimeter, one small square is one millimeter, two three, four, five. So you, this is five millimeters. So if there is a rise in of J point more than one millimeter, then it is significant. See, can you see this? The J point is slightly elevated and slowly it is elevated like this. That means there is a ST elevation. That means the patient is having a MI. Depends upon whichever lead it is. Okay, so this is a ECG change where the patient's having a chest pain and you see the ST elevation. Can you see here? Yes, this is the ST elevation. The J point is slightly elevated and here you can see the elevation. So this is actually inferior wall MI. You don't have to know, okay, it's inferior at your stage. You don't have to know whether it's inferior wall MI or anterior MI or a posterior wall MI. It's okay. But 
you should know it's an mi that is very important you just can't see uh, someone some of your friends can uh, show this is my auntie's uh, ecg which we took uh, re, um, today morning i don't know what is this ecg can you please explain what it is is it uh, is it really emergency should i take him to a hospital immediately or can i wait okay you see the ecg you don't know anything okay i don't think it's nothing is uh, a problem with ecg i think you can go ahead and take some uh, in pan or uh, something and he'll be fine don't do that okay if you don't know tell them we don't know but at uh, I mean you are in third year or final year you can't expect they, they will they will laugh at us isn't it so you are in final year and you don't know what is the ecg so at least you should know to find out it's normal or abnormal so the previous ecg is normal this is the normal ecg and this is the abnormal ecg the abnormal okay there's some abnormality in the ecg please go and meet the uh, cardiologist or a medicine people something like that you have to tell okay for that at least you should know some basics so you see there is st elevation lead to lead 3 and avf this is actually inferior wall mi and of course there is a st depression also can you see the j point is come down okay and tv you can see the tv version here so this is this is a posterior wall mi because this is the, there's something called as st elevation mi non st elevation mi so you can tell this is st elevation mi and this is a non st elevation mi so forget about all this just it's normal ecg abnormal this is abnormal ecg where you can see the st elevation so then you can confirm it's a mi that's it that's what you have to know at this stage okay what are things you are supposed to do if you are a crri or something like that or you are working as a medical officer what you should know okay first is reassure the patient and do not overcrowd and uh, make him um, get more anxiety okay you have to start an iv line any patient any patient coming to the emergency department always think the patient can collapse any time and you have to you have to be on your toes so that's how you are supposed to work on okay So start IV line as early as possible and, and take a ECG. And of course, though it's mono is written, morphine is not the first thing you are supposed to give. Okay, the first is always A, B, and C. Okay, C oxygen. You have to give oxygen, and then you have to give sublingual nitrate, and of course the aspirin, clopidogrel, atro, atrovastatin. These are the drugs you are supposed to give. Just forget about all these numbers. You you don't remember the numbers now. That's okay. We can we can check it later. okay so first is oxygen then you can give sublingual nitrate and if the patient is having a severe pain they can go for morphine okay they can go for morphine if the patient is having a severe chest pain and again it depends upon uh, each person whether uh, they are willing for uh, interventions or they are willing for uh, only uh, i mean for uh, thrombolytic therapy all that depends upon the patient also because it it all it's everything is money also okay so pci is a percutaneous interventions coming to fibrolytics so fibrolytics we all know it breaks the fibrin so any clot it will di uh, dilute the uh, clots so first is commonly used is streptokinase and there are other things like alteplase retiplase streptokinase all that but streptokinase is why it's commonly used is cheap so the person who is not uh, willing to spend so much for uh, interventions they can start with streptokinase okay i will i will use only this drug uh, which is uh, which is hardly around uh, Uh, less than five thousand, maybe. So I'll use only this drug, and uh, I will get admitted. That's what they tell. I don't want any intervention because it it costs some for him. So alteplase again one drug which is a bit expensive than uh, um, streptokinase. That streptokinase will take at least forty uh, five minutes to one hour to go on. Whereas alteplase it's uh, just take you a bit maybe few minutes. Okay. Okay. So that is the first scenario. Coming to the second scenario. so you are attending a marriage where you see a person who is collapsed and throwing seizures okay what is your immediate action so as you have uh, seen in so many movies give keys um, then what they will hold the hand and uh, legs so that he will stop uh, seizure so all that is wrong so the options given are you can have uh, uh, give uh, some people will give uh, iron keys with, to him if you can you some people will hold the hands and limbs so that he will not uh, uh, he will they will not allow him to seize and uh, there is something called as a live lorazepam and arvin which we'll talk about it. okay so please not give any iron keys or uh, don't control his limbs that is not necessary usually any seizure will stop mostly 75 to 90% i think it will stop on its own within few few minutes okay you don't have to do anything what you have to supposed to do is just turn the patient to a 
left atlas he has attended the marriage so he would have had a very full stomach so you if you put the patient in left atrial position even if he's going to vomit the all the vomits going to come out he will not aspirate that's one reason the other reason is when you are lying on a supine position in if you are unconscious your tongue will be a foreign body which will obstruct your airway which will obstruct the patient's airway so that's one of the reason you put the patient na so these are mainly two reasons to put the patient na left lateral position so this is the left lateral position that's otherwise called as recovery position so if the patient is in nir of course you are not going to give keys or control the limbs or all okay so you are going to take care of the airway put the patient in the left lateral position give iv lorazepam okay these are two things we are doing in the idea yeah, immediately as early as possible so right action is you have to assure safety with for the attenders turn is set towards one side to prevent aspiration and remove the hard and sharp materials near him and uh, you can give iv lorazepam as early as possible so what you should not do is as i told don't give any uh, iron things or don't control the movements don't insert anything in the mouth so when you seizuring especially you to prevent the tongue bite what maybe uh, what you will do is you put your own finger your finger in the patient's mouth so don't do that so it will be a your finger will be a foreign body for the for the victim so do not insert anything possibly in the airway and of course do not overcrowd so coming to the third scenario which is uh, rarely seen the, because we are in the city so you are in a, you are in a working the phc where you receive a farmer okay with a history of snake bite 30 minutes ago so what do you do uh, have, you have seen in the movies they will cut and suck all that is there okay they cut and suck the wound and they tie the tourniquet which is which is your immediate action they tie a tourniquet tightly above the site of the bite tie a, tie a tourniquet above the site of the bite in such a way that it allows only one finger try native medicines you have seen you have seen in like, movies they would uh, grind uh, all this green leaves some green leaves which is native medicines and apply on the on the wound do please don't do that place uh, ice some people will place ice on the wound okay so that it reduces the pain and because it numbs the area and reduces the pain that's why that's what they think but that's also not right so the best correct response is come and reassure the patient okay always when you when you have a snake bite what you'll think okay i'm uh, i'm going to die soon so that's what you are uh, your thought will be so first is calm the patient and reassure that nothing will happen and you tie a uh, tourniquet above the site above the site where it allows one finger or one scale this is to prevent uh, from gangrene because you are in a very remote place to shift to a tertiary care hospital will take one hour or two hours you don't know so when you are uh, tying it very tightly what happens the blood supply to the distal part will re- will will slowly slowly reduce reduce and it will stop and it can go for gangrene that's the reason you are going to tie it tight but allow allow at least one finger to enter in between okay do not give anything by mouth why you are not supposed to give anything by mouth is say for example if the patient becomes drowsy what happens is going to collapse or if he collapses so what happens whatever he is he is eating that time he will he might aspirate he might vomit and aspirate that's why you are not supposed to give anything by mouth do not allow him to walk so say uh, there's a snake but usually it will be in the leg so uh, always immobilize the leg do not allow him to walk because the the more the walking the more the the blood supply will be circulating in the whole body so it's going to it's going to be dangerous for the person so that's why i don't allow him to walk immobilize the limb and inform the ambulance as early as possible and shift him to a tertiary care hospital so okay coming to so classification so you, you don't worry about this lrp day viper day all that okay remember this neurotoxic hematotoxic and myotoxic neurotoxic is all cns symptoms hematotoxic is uh, i mean neurotoxic is caused by cobra and uh, crate like uh, ptosis uh, all the cns symptoms hematotoxic so remember it as viper as vascular so you won't forget okay so it is hematotoxic by viper and then myotoxic by sneeze, sea snakes like the patient can present with uh, um, hematuria there's myoglobin urin they can go for compartment syndrome with the bite side so just remember it as neurotoxic by cobra arcade hematotoxic by viper or viper vascular and myotoxic sea snakes okay how do you differentiate whether it's a venomous or non venomous you can't sit uh, next to the snake and see oh this is round and this is uh, triangular oh the, uh, this has a fangs and this has a 
the elliptical pupil definitely not some very rarely some people like when you bring the victim like a snake bite victim they bring the snake also they'll be hit the snake and bring the snake also at that time you should know whether it's a uh, poisonous or non mostly it'll be non poisonous some but uh, but sometimes a poisonous snake they bring okay so at that time you should be able to differentiate between the venomous and the non venomous snake so venomous snake is usually this triangular shaped and uh, the fangs will be there and you'll uh, see a elliptical pupil whereas uh, a non venomous the the shape of the head will be rounded and the pupils will be round and the, there won't be any fang marks so this is how you differentiate between a venomous and a non venomous snake okay symptoms the patient can uh, with a history of a snake bite the patient can uh, come with any of the symptoms or sometimes with no symptoms at all the patient will tell just i had a snake bite uh, half an hour before okay but patient will be absolutely uh, conscious oriented he'll be like normal person it doesn't mean that he will not get any symptoms so may or may not but you have to be always careful so you have to start an iv line always before the before you get the symptoms don't do everything after the patient gets the symptoms the patient can get symptoms like dyspnea dysphonia dysarthria diplopia dysphagia what is dyspnea dyspnea you all know that is the difficulty in breathing dysphonia is phonation the patient will not be able to phonate okay that is dysphonia dysarthria is arthria i mean uh, articulation arthria is articulation they will not be able to articulate the sentences diplopia is there is a double vision diplopia is double vision dysphagia is difficult phagia means uh, i mean swallowing dysphagia means difficulty in swallowing these are the five d's just to remember and then ptosis ptosis is the patient will not be able to uh, open his eyes there will be ptosis and there will be complete paralysis also so these are the symptoms and signs you are you are supposed to look for in a snake bite okay so usually what is bedside lft lft is lung function test you can you can hold your breath and normally count for how long usually it will be more than 20s counts okay if you if the patient cannot count more than 20 in a, uh, in a single breath okay then that means you have to suspect there's a snake bite that's what second is breath holding time you can uh, you can hold a breath even for 1 minute okay so at least more than 45 seconds if the patient cannot hold the breath for 45 seconds that means you have to suspect a snake bite so when you talk when you ask for the history to the patient if he can uh, if he is able to complete a sentence in a breath that means he is fine okay if he is not able to complete a sentence in a breath then again he is at risk so there is something called as 20 minute whole blotting whole blood clotting time so what you do is you take a blood okay take a blood and leave it uh, leave it for at least 20 minutes if the blood does not clot that means there is no i mean at that point of time there is no envenomation of the uh, snake bite if it is positive that means if if it it's can if the blood can move that means it's a positive result that means there's a snake bite so this is called as 20 minute whole blood clotting time so these are very important single breath count breath holding time which is not more than uh, 45 seconds and single breath count will not normally will be 20 20 counts and uh, he'll be able to uh, talk usually but a uh, snake bite he will not be able to complete a sentence and then be 20 minute whole blood clotting time will be will not clot the blood will not clot in 20 minutes usually it will clot within 5 to 8 minutes so how what is the management for the snake bite so it is asv it is anti snake venom or the patient is very sick go for mechanical ventilation so these are the two things you are supposed to do okay so first is anti snake venom and mechanical ventilation so coming to the fourth scenario so old old person who's uh, known hypertensive has come with sudden history of breathlessness and his blood pressure is shootingly high and his heart rate is high his respiratory rate is high so there's tachycardia is there tachypnea is there and hypertensive his uh, blood pressure is very high and if you auscultate is having a bilateral preparations he is uh, spitting the pink frothy sputum so what do you suspect with all this it is a pulmonary edema okay so what are the causes the causes already you see it is a hypertensive so mostly this is a hypertensive pulmonary edema so of course what is the 
a cause for this uh, uh, heart pain it's always not the heart I mean uh, it's not only the heart failure what is the cause for it you should know it could be anemia causing heart failure it could be renal failure causing the pulmonary edema it could be infected intercordis or some drugs like uh, antipsychotics uh, some of the drugs uh, um, nsaids can cause um, heart failure so the patient as you see uh, patient had tachycardia patient had tachypnea breathlessness sweating what are the hypoxic features along with this the patient can have a decrease in level of consciousness also that's a important sign of hypoxic feature it's a important sign and um, there will be bilateral basal crepitations so how do you diagnose heart failure as i told you before um, in in a in the case of mi you should uh, do uh, cardiac enzymes in the cardiac enzyme there was troponin i bnp was there so if the bnp is really high this is the this is a point of care testing it will come immediately within 20 minutes if the bnp is high it's more of cardiac problem if the uh, uh, the blood test you do is the um, diagnostic criteria for heart failure is the nt pro bnp n terminal pro beta natriuretic peptide so if, if this is more than 900 picograms per ml it is diagnostic the patient is having a heart failure what is negative predictive value the negative predictive value means if the pro bnp is uh, is less than 500 or it's normal it's, uh, that means the patient is not having a um, heart failure it's a, it has a very high negative predictive value for heart failure so how do you treat this patient first is make the because the patient will not be able to lie down flat so ask the patient to sit straight and give him oxygen which is needed at that time and give crucimide crucimide or it's called as lasix crucimide you have to give 1 mg per kg or incremental dose 100 100 plus 100 maximum you can give us 360 mg so this is a crucimide this is a what is crucimide it is a diuretic okay so next is injection morphine again in incremental doses it is a maximum you can give us 10 mg so it is again 0.1 mg per kg so you can give injection morphine it also decreases the preload so the next coming is vasodilator vasodilator you use it for uh, to decrease the blood pressure maybe the what we start here in in, in srm says and we will start ntg around 5 to 25 mg, uh, mg per minute infusion we usually start with an infusion Uh, we don't give bolus usually. We start with an infusion, especially if old people. We don't want to reduce the blood pressure drastically. So slowly we'll reduce the blood pressure. So the treatment important is first is uh, make the patient sit straight. Oxygen by any mean by it depends upon each patient. You can uh, keep NRBM or a non-invasive ventilation where if you give 100% high flow oxygen. So that's an IV. Or you can start with morphine or tocilizumab, everything. And then of course you have to start with a vasodilator to decrease the blood pressure okay so we are coming to the fifth scenario a child five year old child is uh, brought to the emergency with a history of uh, respiratory distress who is a non asthmatic so what do you suspect is he is a non asthmatic there should be bilateral bees for the patient so the important is of, of course every time uh, all the patients i have told you is you have to triage you have to do i don't have to tell for each and every scenario you have to triage the patient all the vitals are important start iv lay take care of the a b c uh, that is the airway breathing and circulation this is all important the, i don't want to repeat this and again 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 and again okay so the investigations is you have already started a line you have taken an abg so and you have to take a chest x ray the important complication for asthma is a pneumothorax you should not miss that so that's why we, we usually do a chest x ray to find out uh, any other complications along with the um, uh, normal no, i mean other than the normal chest uh, anything abnormal in the child so abg and chest x ray is important for asthmatic patients so how do you treat this patient of course you make the child in sitting sitting position give oxygen according to the patient like if it's severe uh, uh, bees or something you start on uh, nebulization otherwise they can have their own inhalers of course if you have not started iv line you have to start iv line and you can uh, start with ipratropium and salbutamol nebulization uh, which will uh, ipratropium will dries up the secretion the salbutamol will dilate the bronchus so there will be that I mean, it will dilate the bronchus so that the child can breathe properly okay so these are the bronchodilators we are supposed to use 
So when you will intubate, when you will think that you have to intubate the child, you take an ABG. What all you see in the ABG is you first see the pH, PCO2, PO2 saturation. For I mean, depends upon each case. Renal failure, you you see different things like pH you see, PCO2 you see, bicarb you see for a um, renal failure patient. So each patient is different. So depends upon the patient condition, you see the ABG. So these patient you see a pH. PCO2. So if there is an increasing PCO2, a uh, decreasing sensorium of the child, you have to think of intubation, plan for intubation, and intubate the child. Now, uh, COPD and the asthma is almost the same, but uh, a slight difference will be there. So usually in a COPD, what they tell us to not give oxygen because they are, their blood is always high, CO2 will be there. So normal CO2 is 35 to 45. So usually they'll have 50 or 60, depend upon the how, how many years they are having the COPD. So they are used to the CO2, don't give high flow oxygen and decrease the CO2. That's what they say. But in emergency, if the patient is coming with unconsciousness and is cyanosed, don't wait for to give, okay, two, uh, two liters of uh, O2, four liters of O2. Give, uh, treat the patient with 100 liters of O2. And if it's cyano, I mean, if the patient is really unconscious, you know, he's not obeying your commands, plan for intubation. That's the important thing you're supposed to, to don't give two liters of oxygen just because he has, he, he's a COPD. Again, the investigation is you have to take an ABG. Again, if the CO, uh, you have to look for the PO2. If the patient can die of hypoxia rather than hypercarthia. So um, you have to do a ABG, look for the PO2, PCO2, chest X-ray, and the bloods, normal blood, CBC, RFT, and place all that. And the treatment options is don't he give any oxygen because uh, some, someone will tell, okay, no, don't give any oxygen because it's a non COPD patient. Uh, no. Oxygen 2 to 4 liters? No. Oxygen by non rebreathing mask? No. Patient, the best line of treatment is intubation with 100% oxygen. Because as I told you, hypoxia, hypoxia will kill the patient rather than hypercarbia. Don't hesitate to give 100% oxygen in a hypoxic COPD patient. Very, very important. Okay, do not uh, stop the oxygen for the COPD patient. Coming to the scenario which we usually see, the known diabetic patient found in an unconscious state or a confused state. Okay, so what we do is we do everything. We do we blood pressure, we check heart rate, we take ECG, we'll do everything. But if we forget to do at that time, unconscious, we'll also be touched. So what happens when I we received a patient, okay, um, I mean, a history of uh, same similar history, and they have been taken to a hospital where the patient was intubated. They have done everything, but still the patient is not conscious. Okay, when we receive the patient with the uh, intubate in an intubated state, and when we took a CBG, it was low. So the simple reason is only hypoglycemia. If they would have uh, checked the CBG, okay, and then uh, given the dextrose, the patient would have survived. I mean, he would have avoided, we would have avoided all this intubation, all this uh, problems uh, just by giving uh, sugar. So it's hypoglycemia. Okay. So always ABC. CBG is a must fall. All the patients, not only emergencies, all the patients entering into the emergency, you have to do a CBG is one of, it's like one of the vital signs. Like when you check for the vital sign, in the triage itself, you have to do a CBG. Okay, so give 25%, we have, for this patient, we gave 25% dextrose infusion, um, in, in, uh, infusion, um, and then uh, the patient slowly started coming out. Of course, we, are, we can't extubate this such patient immediately. We have to wait for some time and then extubate. If, was, if it's at home, you can give sugar crystals. If the patient is becoming uh, drowsy or something, as a known diabetic, especially elderly people, you can give uh, sugar crystals at home. Do not give anything orally when the patient is unconscious. Don't give chocolate or uh, or don't give uh, juice or anything if the patient is unconscious. Any unconscious patient, avoid anything orally because it can aspirate and it can uh, go. Uh, I mean, the patient can go for a worse situation. Okay, so now coming to the uh, old female was brought to the emergency with a history of right side weakness, right side body weakness. Since today morning, 7 a.m., they brought uh, the patient by 8 o'clock. Within, within an hour's time, they bought, uh, got the patient. So what do you want to do? What, do you, what is your immediate line of treatment? So you think it's a stroke, okay? So before that, okay, patient is having weakness. There could be some differential uh, diagnosis also, okay? The, uh, 
I mean, uh, the patient is having one hour of weakness. Okay, what all you can take? One is stroke. Okay, the one is hypoglycemia. Always you have to check for the CBG. Sometimes the patient uh, hypoglycemia also they, they can present with stroke. I mean, uh, weakness. And then uh, uh, some people they uh, they present with only lower limb weakness. This is uh, one of the reasons is hypokalemia, hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Even the younger patients, 20 or 25 years, they come with uh, lower limb, limb weakness. So when you check the potassium, the potassium will be less than two or 2.5, very less. So the, uh, when you give potassium, they, they will they will uh, they will absolutely come to the, come back to the normal within two hours. Okay, so it's really a miracle, especially this uh, hypokalemic periodic paralysis. If you don't, if you think that okay, this is a stroke and you do something else and leaving this potassium, then it's gone. Okay, so always uh, you have to suspect any patient with a differential diagnosis, not just one diagnosis, and then you can come back. You can uh, with the history with other things, you can you can uh, come to a diagnosis. So now we are talking about the stroke. So what is stroke? It's like a like a brain attack. It's like a heart attack. We are going to uh, tell it as a it's actually a brain attack. So every minute matters, like an MI, it's equal. The, the MI and stroke are almost the same. Okay, it's every minute matters. But usually the stroke patients who, who are coming to the emergency department will usually come late. They'll come the next day or the or within six hours or within seven hours. Very rarely they come within four, four and a half hours. So as you all know, the brain does not have the facility to store glucose. So they will uh, they'll run out of the glucose when there is a decrease in blood supply to the brain. So how do you confirm stroke? As I told you, you have to do a CT scan or a MRI. CT scan is mainly for to diagnose the patient is not having a hemorrhagic stroke because hemorrhagic stroke, you're not supposed to get, thrombolize the patient. So that's a different uh, field. The, the neurosurgeons will take care of it. Okay. So that's why you take a CT scan to I mean, to, to know whether there is no, there is no hemorrhagic stroke. So how can you remember it as a, a symptoms and signs? you remember us be fast balance the, the patient lose the balance okay and the eyes be blurred vision or sometimes uh, the, the patient cannot close the eyes uh, tightly that's one and face there'll be uh, the, the there'll be uh, one side of the face will be drooping so they cannot uh, close the eyes properly the one side of the there'll be drooping of the saliva on the one side and when you compare a when you come to the a arms will be drifting towards one side and speech they cannot dis, I mean, there'll be disarticulation. They cannot uh, pronounce or there'll be slurring of speech. That's what they tell. Slurring of speech will be there. Of course, mm. if you see all this, immediately call for ambulance and immediately shift the patient to a uh, pressure care hospital. So there's something called as TIG. Uh, TIA is nothing but transient ischemic attack. So transient ischemic attack they are usually what they tell what they have an elderly patient who's having weakness say for an hour and then he'll become normal so what he usually thinks is okay i'm fine now maybe something happened that's why uh, i had weakness so he leads something okay after eating i'm fine and then they just forget about so these are the patients who come with mi and stroke later on but they will not give a history of tia at all to you but what is tia is the patient will have neurological dysfunction okay uh, for at least less than an hour, then but the, then they will not have any evidence of infarction after one hour. Everything, all the symptoms, everything will recover. They will recover within after one hour. So uh, so there are actually huge risk of MI and stroke, which um, they are, they are supposed to give uh, dual antiplatelets, especially um, aspirin or clopidogrel. They have to give uh, dual antiplatelets for uh, further uh, uh, to avoid a stroke or. So uh, when you divide, we classify stroke, 85% is SERS ischemic stroke and only 15% of hemorrhagic stroke. But usually, as you see in the hospital, like we see more of a hemorrhagic stroke also as equal to the ischemic stroke. Practically, I'm talking more of a hemorrhagic stroke because ischemic stroke, many people will not come to the especially to tertiary care hospital. So that's the reason we see almost the same amount of ischemic and hemorrhagic so stroke. Though the... Uh, paper says 85% is ischemic and 15% are hemorrhagic stroke. So you see, this is the hyperdense lesion. Usually, this is the right side and this is the left side. First is that is usually no. This is right and this is left. Okay. <coughs> this is the thalamic bleed. This is a hyperdense bleed, and this is the MCA infarct. Such a big infarct. There's a MCA infarct, and this is 
hypodense. This is a hyperdense and this is hypo. This is a CT brain. So if the patient comes within the four, four and a half hours, you can thrombolize those patients. If, the if it's more than four and a half hours, they, they have to go for interventions. So what are the thrombolites? Usually we give in our hospital is altiplase. So the dose, you just forget about it. If the patient comes within four and a half hours, it is a golden hour and you have to start the thrombolysis. If the patient goes beyond the timing, the patient will go for endovascular interventions and the intervention people, the radiology uh, intervention people will take care of the uh, person. Now, coming to the uh, patient is uh, brought to the ER with history of uh, tablet overdose four hours after the, uh, uh, after the intake of the tablet, okay? What do you do with this patient, okay? If the, there is always patient is conscious, again, you, are, you have to divide this patient to conscious, unconscious. So conscious is having a different uh, uh, treatment, unconscious patient have a different treatment. All poison patients should be managed as if they're, initially they might be, uh, okay, they'll be conscious oriented. So it doesn't mean that it's stable. Maybe at that point of time, it could be stable. The patient can go uh, collapse or can happen. What Anything can happen anytime. So always be uh, careful that uh, this patient can have a life-threatening intoxication also. Okay, when a person is coming to, uh, was brought to you at around in the morning, uh, say the attendants are telling, the patient was, uh, was unconscious in the morning. Okay, we don't know what happened in the night. So... So we have to think of so many things. Okay, maybe if the patient has had a binge of alcohol. Okay, so what you first is you have to check for the glucose. Very very important. So this patient can go for hypoglycemia and then they'll be just lying. So always first is check CBG level. CBG if it's normal, give hundred percent oxygen. Of course, air, airway you have to take care. And then if there's any opioid poisoning, overdose or something, you can try one shot of naloxone 0 0.2 mg. Okay. Thiamine, if the, if the history of um, alcohol or something is there, alcohol binge or something is there, you can give thiamine in a 100 ml MS and you can give all these things and try to see the patient is coming out. Okay. The common antidotes for OPC, OPC is organophosphorus compound. Okay. The antidote is paradoxin. For a paracetamol, it is n acetylcysteine. For a beta blocker, you can give glucagon or insulin. For opioid, as I told you before, it is naloxone. Heparin, heparinol is very, very, very rare. Opioid also is very rare, not, uh, not common in our country. And the commonest is OPCD, paracetamol, and the next common is beta blockers. The others and all is very, very rare. Opioid, heparin, iron and all is very, very rare. So uh, how do you diagnose first is with history and circumferences, like circumstantial evidences, like uh, uh, I saw this tablet, uh, uh, which is empty tablet uh, covers I saw there, uh, or some injections. Uh, some people, OPC, they take uh, even IM, IM injection also they take, or some people, they apply it over the body. So what you do is you have to, um, you'll see, OPC means you'll see the typical features, uh, like salivation, lacrimation, defecation, and the smell also, you'll, this is a typical feature, of, uh, the smell of the OPC, you can tell it's okay, a patient has taken OPC. Okay, and then uh, you put a rice tube wash, if the patient is conscious, you can put a rice tube and wash the, uh, wash and take the, take the sample for gastric analysis, and you can confirm what are the di diagnosis later on. Okay, so... Management, always ABC, airway, breathing, and circulation. If the patient is unconscious, you have to plan for intubation. When you intubate, if the GCS, what is GCS? Is Glasgow Coma Scale. There is a, if the GCS is less than eight, you have, you have to always intubate. So normal GCS is 15 by 15. Okay? If the GCS is less than eight, you have to intubate. If there's a rapid deterioration of the GCS, also you have to intubate. Or there's a respiratory insufficiency, you have to Intubation. These are the four conditions where you have to plan for intubation. So if the patient is conscious, you, you can do a gastric lavage. If the patient is unconscious, you have to intubate the patient and then only you can do a gastric lavage. Otherwise, the patient will go for aspiration and he can collapse any time. So you can give a charcoal lavage. The, the dose is one gram per kg. And... Uh, Stop further exposure. You have to actually, when as soon as the patient comes, you remove all the clothes, wash the body because you don't know what whether he's applied or he has taken it, he has poured it on his body. We don't know. So uh, uh, remove the uh, remove all the dresses uh, to avoid a further exposure, and then clean the uh, body with a uh, body wash or something like that. 
So activated charcoal, what the activated charcoal does, it's absorption. That means it will it will uh, bind with the drug. The activated charcoal will bind with the drug and it avoid it'll avoid uh, getting absorbed in the in the GI tract. So it gets eliminated along with the bowel movements. So the doses, as I told, it's one gram per kg. So the contraindications are uh, if the patient is comatose, you can you can still give if they're unconscious patient um, through the rice tube through the rice tube. But if uh, avoid in a especially in intestinal obstruction, corrosives, or if it's already taken an oral antidote and it's hydrocarbons like petrol or kerosene, usually the children will come with uh, kerosene poison. So all for all these cases, yeah, it's better to avoid the activated charcoal. Now, coming to the 10th scenario, a young male who is brought to the, usually is a dental clinic for tooth extraction. Okay. Mm, the patient developed hoses of the voice, breathlessness suddenly, and sweating and rashes, and was uh, after giving local anesthetic. So uh, as soon as you give a local anesthetic, the patient uh, develop all these symptoms. So what do you do? So what do you think of is anaphylaxis? Clearly shows anaphylaxis, especially dental people, they'll get scared. They, they don't know what to do they, because they cannot start a line. They cannot. Uh, so it's always, uh, always you have to suspect, uh, especially uh, uh, such cases, it's really, really uh, worrying. So in our hospital itself, they have bought uh, one or two cases from the dental block to the ER with, the, with this anaphylaxis. So the patient can have breathlessness, um, angioedema, wheeze, hypotension, uh, tachycardia. They can present with all this. And then the patient sometimes can become unconscious or can go for a cardiac arrest also. Okay. So treat with uh, airway breathing circulation, give a uh, full high flow oxygen, elevate the legs so that um, there'll be a um, flow of, um, I mean, the, the pressure of the, the blood will uh, come to the uh, heart and then give uh, two to three, at least uh, two to three liters of uh, IV fluids. This is mainly a um, distributive shock. This is uh, anaphylaxis, uh, it's a kind of a distributive shock. So there is fluid in the body, but it's, uh, it's the distribution is the problem. So give lots of fluid to, uh, uh, to the patient and give injection adrenaline. So usually adrenaline is in one, uh, one ampule. So in one ampule, you'll have one ML. That one ML is there, you take one ml and you have to dilute and you have to give it. Okay. Other I mean, if, if it's an IV, you have to dilute and give it. Otherwise, you give 0.3 to 0.5 mg subcutaneous or IM you can give. If it's a severe life threatening, you have to always think of giving IV. In the cardiac arrest, it's ACLS protocol. You have to give one mg direct IV. The ACLS protocol is a completely different uh, scenario. Just uh, forget about this. For anaphylaxis, you have to give fluids adrenaline. Start IV line, fluids, until these two are the important things. So coming to the 11th scenario, uh, patient uh, present with severe breathlessness and profuse sweating. As you examine, you notice that there are no breath sounds on the right side and trachea is pushed towards the left side. And respiratory rate is high, pulse is or feeble. Just that there is a high, high potential with the PP is not uh, maybe 90, 60. So what is this? The diagnosis you are thinking a severe asthma no because there is no wheeze so okay because there is no air entry in the right side there is no wheeze so uh, there is no asthma there is no COPD it could be either a pneumothorax so it's a tension pneumothorax there's no history of trauma so it is a tension pneumothorax so what do you do for the patient what happens here is you see this is a intrapleural space so air is gets collected here and the push the lung towards the opposite side towards the left side so what it does is it is pushing the media stem towards the uh, opposite side. So this heart is pushed towards the other side and then get compressed. So when it gets compressed, what happens? The cardiac output also is reduced. The patient can go for hypotension. If you don't relieve this air immediately, the patient is going to uh, arrest any time. <laughs> so what you do is, you do uh, whether you do a chest x-ray first, or you do ICD, or you do chest X-ray, AP and lateral view, or needle thoracosynthesis. So the first line of action for such a tension pneumothorax is don't wait for anything. This is all a clinical diagnosis. There's no, uh, it will take at least half an hour to arrange for an ICD. It will take at least half an hour to get an X-ray uh, ready. But so what you have to immediately do is needle thoracosynthesis is the first line of 
treatment. So how do you do needle thoracocentesis? You have to take a needle or an IV line. Okay, uh, this is the mid clavicular line. This is the second intercostal space. Sorry. This second intercostal space. This is the mid clavicular line. In this, you have to puncture the with the needle so to relieve the air from chest to outside atmosphere. So you sometimes you can if you connect it to the uh, water uh, water bubble with water uh, the the tube if it gets connected to the water you will hear the bubble so much of water will be with so much of air will be gushed into the uh, into the water and you can see the bubble uh, bubbling there so that is uh, pneumothorax so that's what you're supposed to do you have to do a thoracocentesis needle thoracocentesis is the line of treatment at that point of time later on you can do icd all that chest x-ray all that you can do but at that point of time if you don't do that if you wait for all these things the patient can collapse anytime so the first line of treatment is a needle thoracocentesis or oh, elderly male comes to with history of choking while eating and he feels uneasiness in his throat what's your plan so again uh, divides, de uh, depends upon whether the patient is conscious or unconscious. If the patient is able, is conscious, is able to breathe or he is able to cough, encourage the person to cough. When you encourage the person to cough, what happens? There will be a um, intrathoracic pressure is increased, thereby pushes the foreign body outside. Encourage the person to cough till the person uh, collapses or give a uh, hemlich maneuver. You can go for hemlich maneuver. So, this is the universal choking sign. Okay, this is the hemlich maneuver. You hold the patient like this. Okay, hold the fist in between the ziphy sternum and the um, and the umbilicus, and you're going to push inwards and upwards. Thereby, you are increasing the intrathoracic pressure. Okay, you are you are going to increase the intraabdominal pressure. Thereby, intrathoracic pressure and the foreign body comes out. So you have to do. Uh, ask the patient to uh, cough. If he's not able to cough, you do a hemlich. I mean, if he's not, if he's, uh, uh, not able to cough or breathe, you're going to do a hemlich maneuver. If it's still, you, you do this hemlich maneuver till the foreign body comes out or till the person collapses. If the person collapses, you're going to start the CPR like what you do the basic life support. So coming to the last uh, slide, what would you do? If you find a person unconscious, would you sprinkle some water as you uh, watch uh, uh, some movies when they sprinkle water and give something morally or tap him on his shoulders and try to wake him up. So the, the import, the thing what you're supposed to do is tap him on his shoulders and try to wake him up. If he's not waking up, then it's a cardiac arrest scenario. Establish unresponsiveness. You're going to, after uh, checking for the, after tapping him on his shoulders, if he's not waking up, okay, call for help. Check for the pulse or the, uh, over the carotids. If there's no pulse, you're going to start CPR, 30 is to 2, which is the basic life support. I think you all know the basic life support. You have uh, undergone this training in the first year itself. So I have finished. To save a life, you don't have to do great things, but you can do simple things in a great way. Okay. Thank you very much. I can take the questions if any. Thank you, ma'am. You ended on a lovely note. And... Um... If any questions are there, please type them either in the chat box here or on the comment section on YouTube. We will be taking the questions now. Okay, ma'am, I'm starting the questions. The first yeah, question yeah. is, Okay, uh, is it a dictum to take an ECG for any chest pain case in a casualty? Of course, of course. Any chest pain, not only chest pain, any patient who's above 20 years. See, I'll, I'll tell you a scenario which has is, which is happened in our college. 18-year-old, second year in BDS, okay? He had a uneasiness in the, I mean, he had a gastric pain. So what he did is he went with his friends to the uh, Archana. Uh, he, he was, uh, I mean, he, he told his friends that I didn't eat in the morning. That's why maybe I got gastritis. I will go have a uh, food, uh, something to eat. So he was eating there. He After he ate also, he still had uh, uh, pain over the gastric region. So the friends told, we'll go to the emergency. Um, no, no, we'll wait for some time and see. So suddenly he collapsed. He collapsed in the Archana. So they were call, we were called from uh, ER. So we, we took him and we brought him to the emergency where he had a ventricular tachycardia. So it's another cardiac arrest. 
rhythms okay so we immediately shocked him we revived him so he is lucky that he was inside the um, campus so i'm telling why i'm telling is uh, even at 18 years when you can get an mi and when he can arrest so uh, i think you have to take uh, for everyone who comes to the emergency department it's a protocol to take a ecg even uh, say a patient comes with a 60 year old comes with history of uh, um, maybe a uh, femur uh, fracture okay so you are going to do x ray or pop all that all that that is only radio i mean only uh, um, orthopedic problem but still i will take an ecg for this old lady also they can it's not always only one this is human body it's not you should have only one problem at a time it's not like that you can have two problems also at a time right so always it's better to take an ecg um, it's uh, it's safer to take an ecg at that time rather than uh, um, if something happens later are you I mean don't feel guilty later just to avoid your own guilty it's better to take an ecg okay ma'am um next question is if the patient has copd or other respiratory pathology and has come with a snake bite do we wait for uh, white blood white blood cell count or do we start empirical management no you see copd you have to airway breathing all will not wait for anything you have to intubate you have to unconscious all you have to intubate you give 100% oxygen side by side you emergency is not only okay one at a time it is uh, thousand things at a time okay mm-hmm. so because there are not only one person there okay so one person will do one thing the other person will do some something else okay it's not that you have to wait for and uh, see the patient dying no it's not that so you have to you have to intubate you have to do something one person will start an iv line will will take blood and will do that thing okay by the time you intubate your blood, whole blood clotting clotting time will be going to be ready isn't it yes ma'am Next question: How yeah. can we treat scorpion sting since it may rarely cause pancreatitis? Pancreatitis is not immediately. So as soon as a scorpion sting, you will not get pancreatitis immediately. It, it's a, it's a late complication. It's not an immediate mm-hmm. complication. So pancreatitis again, uh, they, when the patient presses a severe abdominal pain, they will not be able to uh, sit or lie down or uh, you have to give again. There will be a third. face loss there will be so much of fluid loss you have to give fluids and uh, and analgesics you have to painkiller and fluids this is the this is the two uh, things you have to give there is uh, otherwise there's nothing much you have to control the pain and you have to give fluids pancreatitis mm-hmm. you cannot avoid pancreatitis okay there's idiopathic cause of pancreatitis also the main cause of pancreatitis is alcohol alcohol induced uh, pancreatitis okay ma'am um next question what is the first line of management when a patient with very low oxygen saturation comes to the er example a covid patient ha huh. okay so um, the patient comes to the er everyone will be first careful okay so there's something called as happy hypoxia at present it's going on so though the saturation is very low say 60% okay in room air so still the patient is happy sitting there okay so what you do is you give uh, you start with uh, uh, niv oxygen first is you have to give uh, an nrb and non rebreathing mask oxygen just to see if the patient patient's uh, uh, saturation is picking up so if it does not pick up you start with niv or a prone ventilation that's what they say now okay prone ventilation is not so fine it's a prone ventilation you give 100% oxygen with the patient making the patient lie down on a prone position okay you try that okay if that also does not then you have to intubate there's no way Okay, ma'am. And of course, you have to take a chest X-ray to see the ground glass appearance. COVID test should be done. All this has to be done side by side. Okay, ma'am. Next question: In case of poisoning okay. while washing their body, what if the patient goes for hypothermia? Yeah, you should not uh, give ice water or something. Just a plain <laughs> water. <laughs> you should not pour ice water on the patient. Just a plain, like it's how you are taking bath. Okay, just mm-hmm. uh, clean it up. Clear. I mean, just pour, put normal water. and cover 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 him up don't just open it and keep it okay mm-hmm. just clean it and then uh, wipe it and cover the patient cover the patient with a blanket okay ma'am. very rarely in, in india we go for hypothermia we can go for hyperthermia but not for hypothermia so easily especially in icu patients we can maybe but not in the er i have not seen any hypothermic patients in er okay ma'am. how to manage hepatic encephalopathy with seizures seizures yeah. you immediately you have to give midazolam no i mean so lorazepam there is no other way to control the seizures at that, that point of time it's the same like any any other seizures 
don't, don't think of hepatic and whatever the reason are immediately how to control the seizures is important or oh, it's like a copd patient coming in unconsciousness or oh, patients having a copd i don't want to give oxygen it's the same thing patients having a, a hepatic encephalopathy I, i should not give this i should not that uh, it's not leave the patient seizuring isn't it okay okay next um next question is ma'am uh, somebody is asking step 2 kinase causes anaphylaxis so what do you do during uh, myocardial no, infarction yeah what do you be, what we do is we give uh, we give uh, adrenaline okay we stop the drug at that point of time okay okay we treat anaphylaxis and then again uh, we have to continue with the step 2 kinase we try step 2 kinase always we have to stop okay ma'am you have to treat anaphylaxis you stop the drug what whatever drug you give is not only for streptococcus any for any any drug or anything you can have anaphylaxis even for groundless you can have anaphylaxis stop the drug immediately okay if it's very minimal anaphylaxis like itching or something you give uh, some uh, avil or something and then i can you can try and restart the streptococcus okay if still is having uh, uh, worse symptoms you go to stop streptococcus and uh, Uh, go for some other treatment like uh, taking for PCI intervention, something like that. Okay. Next question. In yeah. case of anaphylactic shock, what can we do if EpiPen is not available? Okay. So there's nothing could you could do. You should uh, give only uh, epinephrine. There is no other drug. That is the only drug. Okay. There is there is no see a hospital. If you are taking the patient to hospital, there's no other limits. There's no. It's a it's a. You cannot tell that's a hospital. Hmm. Understood. So there is no hospital without adrenaline. Okay, ma'am. Or you have to take him to a immediately to a uh, nearby hospital. Okay. Um. Next question. Uh. Yeah. Somebody wants to know what they should do if somebody collapses in an airplane and cannot breathe. They cannot breathe. Okay. So you can give uh as uh as a first aid. Okay, as a they actually a, want to know if an emergency tracheostomy should be. Ah uh, no no no! Don't uh, what is that Marcel movie? Yeah, uh? don't do all that uh, uh, card cutting and all. Okay, it's very very risky in the in the flights and all. You can't do all that. You can give mouth to mouth breathing. Okay, you can give uh, you can attach. There will be AED in the flights. You can attach the AED. You can give shock. It depends upon what whatever uh, the AED tells. okay so you can give mouth to mouth breathing it's it's uh, say the bls you have to finish the bls don't do all this tracheostomy in the in the flights and you're going to kill the patient something happens okay so just do basic life support in a in a different atmosphere rather than the hospital okay ma'am next question what to do for kerosene poisoning what is the antidote there is no antidote for kerosene poisoning see what happens when you when you pour a petrol or a kerosene on the floor it evaporates Hmm. okay so the the important thing is you have to look for usually the child will not take more than uh, unless intentionally the child will not take more than 5 ml because the the taste is different maybe by mistake the child would have taken or if an adult is takes about to on 500 ml or 200 ml of uh, kerosene he has to be admitted he has to uh, I mean, we have to do a chest x ray or something like that okay so this will cause pneumonitis or inflammation of the uh, lungs nothing got at that time you don't you should not do uh, uh, put trials tube and wash hydrocarb these are the hydrocarbons you're not supposed to um, give a lavage for hydrocarbons it will evaporate on its own okay um next question if a patient has a a cut at the wrist as suicidal tendency sorry what cut at the wrist yeah as suicidal what tendency you what to do first if somebody's cut their wrist oh okay okay just give pressure just give okay. a good pressure okay at least for 10 10 to 15 minutes hmm. cut the wrist okay if you give okay. a good pressure okay because maybe some tendon rupture or something they cut the tendon or a cut the radial artery whatever it is you give a good pressure good tie it up and then uh, shift him immediately to the hospital hmm. okay what about a case of drowning drowning okay so drowning is uh, usually they'll be uh, very cold as soon as you, as, you, as soon as you uh, bring the patient out out of the water okay so warm them up okay if, the, if there's no pulse or something do start cpr this is the same thing as bls you start the bls but one thing is you have to warm them up they uh, i mean uh, they take a longer time to come back so that's why the prolonged basic life support is important in case of drowning 
if you are uh, say for example if you are uh, doing cpr for uh, half an hour or 40 minutes in a normal individual you have to do more, uh, more than uh, one hour for a drowning patient okay so you have to cover them up first is important to warm them up okay ma'am management of yeah. heat stroke opposite hmm heat stroke first is um usually it will be more than uh, one or two one or three i have seen till one or eight okay so first is remove all the dress okay give him a um, good sponge bath sponge bath is you put a normal sanit don't put ice water or anything give a normal sanit there's no point in giving uh, paracetamol for these patients okay because the thermo regulatory center is uh, switched off for these patients okay so you keep a fan keep a fan nearby give iv fluids iv saline nasal uh, i mean uh, uh, intra nasally you can give a uh, bladder i mean uh, wash abdominal wash bladder wash you can give start iv and give fluids okay you have to the aim is to reduce the temperature that's what you are going to do so put a, put a blanket over the patient and with a I mean, wet blanket put a wet blanket over the patient and uh, with a uh, fan nearby so that it get get the body gets cooled up okay ma'am next question a conscious patient with copd comes with uh, spo2 79% mm-hmm. should we intubate him no no why you want to intubate uh, i as i told you before any gcs the gcs normal gcs 15 okay if the gcs is reduced less than 8 or if there is a deteriorating gcs from 15 okay then you plan for intubation why for uh, saturation less than 70 you don't have to intubate you give oxygen and see first okay whether it's improving or not you take an abg and slowly you can you can you have time to do step by step work you directly don't intubate everyone okay ma'am next question um in pre is precordial thump validated in witnessed no, cardiac no, arrest no no there's the precordial thump has been taken out long 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 time ago okay ma'am. um in case of seizure patient if the patient bites the tongue what to do like nothing can be done just leave it it will automatically heal by itself mm. okay uh, i just like to tell everybody before i go on to the next question that in the next 5 minutes we have to end the session so um i will take as many questions as i can till then after that we will conclude the session the next question is mm. a person suddenly becomes unconscious no history of diabetes okay bp is it safe to give patient salt slash sugar water as in common household practices and how to identify if patient has gone for low bp or high bp okay as i told you before if the patient is unconscious nothing by oral should be given okay you don't give anything orally you shift the patient as early as possible to a nearby hospital don't uh, you should not any bp you, how will you check bp whether it's a high bp or low bp you're not going to do anything at home so shift the patient as early as uh, possible to the hospital don't give anything by mouth even with hypoglycemia also call the ambulance they'll come they will maybe in the, uh, the paramedic can give uh, give uh, uh should mean iv dextrose if there is hypoglycemia okay next anything. question mm. uh, what happens if a known hemophilia a patient comes with severe head trauma okay so we have to arrange blood for these patients usually they they need blood okay start iv line okay arrange for blood okay so uh, give blood that's it okay ma'am and um, what is the immediate measure you have to take in case of electric shock okay electric shock you have to be very careful because it's the yeah, the outside atmosphere is different from the inside atmosphere that means the the body might, might look normal to you but there there be so much of problems inside the body so that means later on it will it will come out so because uh, uh, electric shock usually have a entry wound and exit wound so you first you have to see because the where the shock enters the body is the entry wound where the uh, shock leaves the body like into the um, earth is the exit wound okay you can see the entry and exit wound it usually crosses through the heart so it can uh, it can cause uh, problems in the heart it can cause arrhythmias like vtvf always start a, and there will be so much of uh, fluid loss in this 
So start IV line. It's like a birth patient. Okay. So start IV line. Give fluids. Give fluids according to the uh, how much of the birth externally, and also uh, look for the vitals or all BP. How is the BP everything? And then give fluids. And you have to take an ECG also for these patients. So uh, I mean, any ECG changes at that point of time, and usually these patients will be thrown out from the um, uh, what from the electrical point site. So if they are thrown out, you have to look for any uh, trauma like a head injury or a neck injury or any other injuries to make sure that there is no orthopedic problem for the patient. Okay, ma'am. Two questions more. I'm going to be taking. Uh, what to do in road traffic accident, head injury to stop bleeding on spot uh, if the patient is unconscious? Okay. Any bleeding anywhere, say it's a wrist or head or wherever it is, you give a good compression. That's very very important for that at that point. You can't do more than that uh, in that situation. So you give a good compression for at least fifteen to twenty minutes, and then shift him to a safer place. Wherever is the bleeding, no problem. Give compression. Okay, ma'am. Last question. You've answered this before, but uh, that time we hadn't started. Uh, okay. What is the scope of emergency medicine in India and abroad? Like which colleges offer courses and what other future perspectives are there? So there, there is. I mean, recently, I think for past five years, they have started MCA recognized uh, emergency medicine. Okay. Before that, before that, uh, it started in two thousand two. MD emergency medicine started in two thousand two, and only in Ramchandra, which is not MCA recognized. Uh, but recently, uh, in, uh, within four five years, I think they started MCA recognized courses. Emergency medicine outside India and inside India, they are very demanding. Everyone needs the emergency people. Even even in our own ER, we are a shortage of uh, emergency doctors now. So though we are we are the first to start an uh, emergency department uh, in whole India, um, it's it's actually a good course. And it's uh, one more is uh, one more I can tell is that it's a end specialty end specialty as of now. So as as days goes on, as the years goes on, it uh, I mean there'll be super specialties for this course also. But at present, it's an end specialty and it's a growing field. So there people still need emergency physician for every hospital. I feel every hospital should have an India physician. And ab abroad also, it's quite a demanding field. I think you you there's a lot of sp uh, scope in and outside uh, India. Okay, ma'am. Thank you for the your time in this lovely session, ma'am. We are going to conclude. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you, everyone, for attending. If you have any more questions, you can post them in the WhatsApp groups, and I will try to get them answered from ma'am if possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. bye we will bye. be ending the session now. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.